Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Sorry, it's not an episode but yet another chapter or a lesson of history. And uh, I know it must become or it must have become boring for you all so as to log into YouTube and watch all these videos being uploaded by the teachers but then we have to find ways to make this time productive for each one of us. So I hope that you all will be listening to this video and also completing all the assignments which will be following this video and also studying a bit but alongside you all should also keep on enjoying and keep on keeping everyone along with you or around you happy and please do not venture out of your homes so today's lesson which we are going to start is the union parliament or the union legislature okay so what we hear what we have are having right now over here is the constitution of india it is in the constitution of india but it is the cover page of the constitution of india and this is one of the longest written constitutions not one of the longest this is the longest written constitution of the world just because it goes on to uh, sorry so many hundreds of pages and why is it so because it is said that most of the people who were drafting the constitution or who were in the drafting committee of the constitution were lawyers and the words of the lawyers can run into so many pages and it is also said that indian constitution is one of the most detailed constitution of the world which means that it has details of all the provisions or how the state and the union will be managing all the affairs of the state and also of the country there are three organs of the constitution the first one is the legislature second comes the executive and lastly we have the judiciary what is the legislature legislature or what does the word legislate mean the word legislate means so as to make laws so the legislative part of our constitution or the legislature makes laws for the entire country next comes the executive what is the role of the executive executive also stands for you can find the word executive it has some reference with execute so execute means to carry out some work the laws which are made by the legislature are executed by the executive branch of the constitution and lastly we have the judiciary the judiciary is one part of the constitution or such or this organ of the constitution is separate from both the executive and the legislature the judiciary is there so as to protect the laws which have been made by the legislature now when we hear the word parliament the chapter this chapter deals with the parliament or the union legislature when we hear the word parliament the first thing that comes to our mind is this but then the parliament isn't all this as it was said about asgard that it is not the place which makes asgard but it is the people so this parliament is also not made up of this building alone but all but by the people who sit in this parliament or who take part in the parliamentary proceedings when we talk of the parliament or we can just have a look at this flow chart over here here we have the constitution the three organs of the constitution the legislature the executive and the judiciary or the judiciary the legislative or the parliament consists of the president alongside the rajya sabha and the lok sabha the executive consists of the prime minister and the council of ministers and the judiciary consists of the supreme court the high court and the states and the district court when i had said that the or there is something to be kept in mind the executive is a part and parcel of the legislature and the executive is directly responsible to the legislature here we can see the executive consists of the prime minister and the council of ministers when we say prime minister and the council of ministers the prime ministers and the council of ministers are very much part and parcel of the parliament the prime minister and the council of ministers may be members members of the rajya sabha or the lok sabha when we talk of the rajya sabha and the lok sabha we first come to the lok sabha or before that we should deal about the unicameral and the bicameral legislatures there is a or most of the parliaments around the world are bicameral legislatures what is the bicameral legislature or what is the unicameral legislature those parliaments which have or those legislative bodies which have only one house is an unicameral legislature and those legislative bodies having two houses are bicameral legislatures the indian parliament or the union parliament as you must have guessed by now the union parliament is a bicameral legislature because it has two houses the lok sabha on one side and the rajya sabha on the other if we take examples of the unicameral legislatures 
most of the Indian states, the legislatures of the Indian states, for example, the legislature of Jharkhand, it has only one house, that is the Vidhan Sabha. It does not have the Vidhan Parishad. That is why the legislature of the state of Jharkhand is a unicameral legislature, whereas the legislature of the Union Parliament or the Indian Parliament at the center is a bicameral legislature, just because it has two houses, the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. But when we say what is the parliament made of or who are the part or who is the part of the parliament, we have three people or the three bodies which makes up the parliament. First, we have the president of India. Next comes the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. So the parliament is having three distinct and separate bodies, the president of India, the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. When we talk or when we read the preamble of or the preamble to the constitution of India, there is a word over there which mentions federal. India is a federal country or we have a federal setup over here. What does being a federal country mean? It means that there is division of power. Where does the division of power happen? The division of power is there between the center and the state. The center makes laws on a few things and the states make laws on a few things and the center does not interfere in the matters of the state in a few things and the state does not interfere in the matter of the center. This means there is a division of power. Our constitution has the following federal features. First, we have dual government and distribution of power. Dual government means there is government at the center and at the states and there is distribution of power between the center and the states. Next, we have supremacy of the constitution. What does supremacy of the constitution mean? It means that all the powers of the center and the states are directly derived from the constitution. None of the powers which the center or the states exercise is something outside the constitution. The constitution is the sole body which gives the center and the states its powers. The feature of the constitution which ensures that we are a federation is that the supreme court is the final interpreter of the constitution. What this actually means is that when there is a division of power between the center and the states, it may at times so happen that the center or the state may go beyond their powers or exercise such powers which are not in their limits. That is why the Supreme Court is there so as to rein in those powers or at times when the center and the states go beyond or exercise beyond their power, the Supreme Court can prevent such a thing from happening. So the Supreme Court is the final interpreter of the constitution or the Supreme Court is the one or whatever the Supreme Court says about some feature or some act or some of the article of the constitution, that is what is to be followed by the entire country. When we talk of the parliament, the president does not sit in the parliament, but the president addresses both the houses of the parliament whenever he wants to do so and also compulsorily at the start of each or the at the starting session of each year of the parliament. Now we come to the Lok Sabha. The Lok Sabha is also called the house of the people. It is so called because the members of the Lok Sabha are elected directly by the people during the general elections which happens in every five years or after every five years these people or the people elect those members who are there in the Lok Sabha directly that is why it is also called the house of the people. Lok Sabha generally has a term of five years but at times this term of five years may end abruptly or before the entire five year is expired or at times during times of national emergency this term of the Lok Sabha can be extended but this extension can happen only for one year at a time. The Lok Sabha consists or the Lok Sabha when we talk of the composition of the Lok Sabha it cannot have more than 552 members at a time. Over here 552 members of which 550 will be elected and two members are to be nominated by the president of the Anglo-Indian community if the president so thinks that the Anglo-Indian community is not adequately represented in the Lok Sabha. But as of now, the Lok Sabha has 545 members of which 543 have been elected by the people and two of them or two members have been nominated by the president belonging to the Anglo-Indian community. The 543 members which are elected by the people are elected from the constituencies. Now what is a con constituency? A constituency is a well-defined territorial area of a country. Well-defined territorial area means that the definition or of that constituency or the territory of that constituency is properly marked and that constituency is to elect one member of the parliament each time there is a general election. 
or the constituency elects one member to the Lok Sabha every time there is a general election. So there are 543 constituencies in India as of now and two members are elected or nominated by the president from the Anglo-Indian community. That is why we have 545 members as of now. What are the qualifications for a person so as to become a member of the Lok Sabha? The first and foremost qualification for to become a member of the Lok Sabha is that the person who is wanting to stand for election so as to become a member of the Lok Sabha has to be a citizen of India. Secondly, that person has to have attained minimum of 25 years of age. He or she should also have such qualifications which are asked or which are made so by the laws of the parliament from time to time. And that person should also be a registered voter in some or the other constituency of India. But there are at times certain disqualifications also. What disqualifies a member from becoming a member or what disqualifies a person from becoming a member of the Lok Sabha? Some such disqualifications are that person, if that person is dis, or if that person is declared to be of unsound mind, then he or she is ineligible to become a member of the Lok Sabha. If that person holds an office of profit, then that person is ineligible to become a member of the Lok Sabha. If that person has been declared an undischarged insolvent, what it actually means is that that person has been or that person does not have money so as to take care of his loans and other such obligations then that person may be may be declared as an undischarged insolvent by the banks and by the other laws of the country then that person is ineligible to become a member of the Lok Sabha. Now when we talk of the office of profit, office of profit is nothing but those offices for which the government pays for or if a person is holding that office or if a person is a member of some community or some organization or some office for which the government is paying or if the work related to that office is directly related to the government then that office is deemed to be or called the office of profit. You have to keep in mind that if a person works for some private entity which is not funded by the government then that office or that post does not qualify to be an office of profit. So a person working for a private company or a private entity can stand for the member of Lok Sabha election and that person can hold both the office of the Lok Sabha and also the office in the private entity simultaneously. But if a person is holding an office of profit, then the person has to resign from that office of profit in order to be eligible to become a member of the Lok Sabha. There are different sessions of the parliament and when a session is in front or when there is a session ongoing session the members of the Lok Sabha as well as the Rajya Sabha they meet so as to transact or so as to discuss business of the house. Business of the house means so as to make laws, so as to discuss on the existing laws, so as to make amendments to the laws and so as to discuss about the prevailing situations of a country. Every day before the start of a session there is a quorum which is taken. A quorum is nothing but the attendance of the members of the Lok Sabha. So as to start the business of the day, there has to be a minimum of one tenth of the total members of the house present in the house. So the quorum of the Lok Sabha will be or which has 545 members, the quorum or one tenth of that number will be 55 members of the house. So 55 members have to be present during the start of the session of each day or during the or before the start of business transaction of each day so as to start the session of that Lok Sabha or of the house of that day that is the quorum of the house if the quorum is not there then the business does not start or the session does not take place on that day there is another important thing which has to be kept in mind is the leader of the opposition of the Lok Sabha now when there is a general, general election after the general election takes place members of the Lok Sabha the party which gets the maximum number of seats they form the government or the executive and the parties which do not make the government they are forming the opposition when or they are they are the forming a group which is called the opposition we have to keep in mind one thing which is called the national party those parties are called national parties which gain one tenth of the total number of seats during the general election so a party which will be having 55 members or more will be deemed or will be said to be a national party and to, out of those parties in the opposition benches or in the or of the opposition the leader of the largest opposition party is said to be the leader of the opposition
So we'll leave it till this much for today. In the next lecture, we'll cover the remaining parts of the chapter and we'll discuss about the Rajya Sabha, the functions of the Speaker of the Lok Sabha and everything else that is in the chapter. Till then, please stay safe, be safe and keep enjoying. Thank you.